Psalm 118. Today I've given my message the title, Hosanna to Jesus. And you've heard the children sing and we've shouted together the word Hosanna. It's a Bible word. It's a Palm Sunday word. But what does Hosanna mean and why do we say it? We're going to talk about that today as we look at the pages of Scripture. But before we get into the message, I want to tell you about something that happened uh, in Pakistan this past August. It was a Tuesday morning, a 10th grade student, a guy got up, had his breakfast like he always has his breakfast, packed his backpack with his books and the things he needed for school, put his backpack on his shoulder, left his little mud-bricked home where he lived with his mom and dad, and then he got on a cable car that took him from the village in the mountains where he lived in northwest Pakistan across a deep mountain valley to where his school was. And as he got on that cable car, about seven school kids got on board with him. There were eight of them on the cable car. And that cable car had been a lifeline to that community for years and years and years. Kids used it to get to school like this guy was doing that day. And then when people in the village were sick, they would use it to get them over to the hospital. They really depended on that cable car. It took them back and forth and back and forth. That morning, that Tuesday morning back in August, no one really knows what happened or what caused it, but two of the cables snapped and it left all of the passengers stranded, just dangling hundreds of feet above the ground with really no way to to get back to either side of the mountain. And so they called the Pakistani military. They showed up and for 12 hours they worked. It was grueling work. It was hard work. But here's what they did. First of all, they dropped down a rope from a helicopter and they were able to save two of the passengers by having them climb up that rope. And then as it got darker and darker, they ran a zip line from the mountainside over to the cable car and they were able to bring people back via the zip line. And so eventually everybody on board, the kids, everybody was saved. But I think about those kids spending 12 hours on that cable car And there is no question what they were thinking and probably what they were saying and what their moms and dads were thinking and saying. Somebody help us. Somebody rescue us. Somebody save us. And that's what the word Hosanna means. It means save us. It means rescue us. It means help us. Now, if you look up the word Hosanna in a dictionary or an English thesaurus, you'll find that hallelujah is usually listed as a synonym for Hosanna. And in in the way we use the term, sometimes they, they are the same, but they're really not the same. Hallelujah is a shout of praise. Hosanna is a cry for help. And that's what was happening on that first Palm Sunday as Jesus Christ was riding into the city of Jerusalem. And we talked about all the incredible things that happened as they were waving the palm branches and putting the palm branches out on the roadway in their own clothes. And he was riding in on a donkey's colt and they were shouting out, Hosanna. And it was a praise to him. But even more, it was a cry for help. Lord, save us. Lord, help us. And today, every person in this room needs to have a Hosanna in our hearts to say, Lord, help me. Lord, rescue me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, do what you alone can do in my life. Lord, save me. That's what our psalm talks about today. In fact, the psalm that we're reading is the same psalm that they were shouting and quoting before the Lord as he came into the city of Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Stand with me as we read God's word together. Psalm 118, beginning in verse 19. The Bible says this, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. 
It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Lord, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this good day that you have made. And Lord God, we rejoice. We are glad in this day that you have given us. Lord, in these moments, I pray that you would move me out of the way and God, that you would speak to your people in this place. Lord, I I pray for those who are here who have never been saved. Lord, today, show them that they can call on you and say, save me, Lord, and you will save them. Give them your gift of eternal life. And Father, I I pray for believers in this room today. Lord, I pray that we would cry out to you and say, Lord, in our circumstance, in our pain, in whatever we find ourselves in where we need you and you alone, God, save us, deliver us, help us, rescue us. And thank you, Lord, that as we call out to you, you hear and you answer. Lord Jesus, we give this time to you and we ask that you would speak. For we pray these things in your holy name, Jesus. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. I want you to look in verse 25 of our text where the word of God says, save us, we pray, O Lord. That phrase, save us, we pray, in the Hebrew language is hashiana. Hashiana. It came into the Greek New Testament as Hosanna, Hashiana, Hosanna. It means save us, Lord. I want to talk to you today about some of the reasons that you can call on Jesus, whatever your circumstance is, and say, Lord, I need you to help me. Lord, I'm placing my hope in you. I'm trusting in you. I'm asking you to intervene in my life. I want to talk to you about some reasons that you can call on him and know that he will answer you today. And there's some of you who are here today who, I mean, you are really needing this message and you're feeling it because you're going through something in your life and you've sort of come to the end of yourself and you don't know what to do. Today, God wants you to call out to him and say, Lord, help me. And I mean, really mean it in your heart, not just saying it as something that we say. I mean, to really say, Lord, help me. And he will answer you. Some of you are here today and you need to call out Hosanna, but you're not even feeling it. You don't even realize the situation you're in. But today God wants to speak to you and show you, hey, he alone is your source of help. He alone is your only hope. And he wants you to cry out to him. We're going to see four different reasons that we can cry out to Jesus for help and find hope in him. First of all, the Bible says this, we can find hope in Jesus because of the justification Jesus brings. Because of the justification Jesus brings. Notice what the Bible says in verse 19 and verse 20 of the text. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them. The psalmist calls out to the Lord and says, Lord, I want you to open up to me the gates of your righteousness. I want to enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Verse 20, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. And so the picture is the psalmist is coming up to the city of Jerusalem, coming up to Mount Zion, coming up to the temple, and he's asking for gates to be opened to him. Open up the gates of righteousness. Here's the thing. On the temple, there is no, and there was no gate of righteousness. In the city of Jerusalem, the different gates have different names. None of them are called the gates of righteousness. So it's not speaking of a literal gate here. It's speaking instead of a spiritual gate, the gate of righteousness that leads into the presence of God himself. Open to me the gates of of righteousness, and then the Bible says in verse 20, this is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. And so there's, there's a gate of righteousness that the righteous may enter through. Here's the problem. 
none of us are righteous. Now, we may feel like we're righteous. We may think that compared to other people, we're righteous. But the Bible says, speaking of us, there is none righteous, no, not even one. None of us are righteous because the word righteous doesn't just mean pretty good. It doesn't just mean okay. It means that there's no spot or blemish on us at all. From a legal standpoint, it means we, we never have broken any of God's law, even to the smallest degree. From a moral perspective, it means that we've never done anything that God says is wrong or sinful in his eyes. From a spiritual perspective, it means that there is no stain on us spiritually. There is none of us who are righteous. But praise God, there is one who is righteous. And his name is Jesus. And he has the ability to enter into the gates of righteousness, into the presence of God himself, because he is God. Because he came and lived a perfect and sinless life. The Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are, and yet without sin. He is righteous, and he becomes our righteousness. Notice what the Bible says in verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. He, he becomes our salvation. He becomes our righteousness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, the Bible says this, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Notice, it doesn't just say he gave us wisdom from God. It says Jesus became wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He became our wisdom. He became our righteousness. He became our sanctification, the, the one that makes us holy. He became our redemption. He purchased us for God. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Listen, you can stand before the Lord and cry out to him, Lord, save me, help me. And though there's nothing righteous about you, nothing righteous about me, we can come into the very presence of God because of the righteous one, Jesus, who justifies us, who makes us righteous. Otherwise, we could never come into his presence. Several years ago, Michelle and I were going to go to a hospital and visit a little boy in our church who he was very ill and, and his, his uh his system was just so messed up that he, he, he didn't have any type of way of fighting infection or germs. And so we got there and they told us, now before you go in to see him, you have to go into this clean room. You have to go into this changing room and, and you have to put on stuff so that you, you don't bring any germs into his presence. Now listen, Michelle and I had bathed that morning before we got to church, before we got to the hospital. We had on clean clothes. We had used soap. But our righteousness, our cleanness wasn't clean enough to be in the presence of this little boy because he had no way of fighting infection. So we came into this clean room and, and we put on stuff to, to make us clean enough to be in his presence. We put on gowns that were sterile and germ-free and, and, and guards over our shoes and, and something over our heads and something over our eyes and masks over our faces and, and gloves on our hands. And when we, had, when we were clothed in that, then we could come in and see that little boy. The Bible says that in our sin, we are separated from God. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 64 verse 6, our righteousness is like a filthy garment in God's sight. Uh, us at our very best, we at our very best are still not righteous enough for God. We can't come into his presence, not because he's vulnerable, but because God is holy and pure. And the word of God says in the book of Habakkuk, chapter one, verse 13, his eyes are too pure to even look on evil. And so our sin separates us from God, but Jesus Christ has become our righteousness. And because of the justification that Jesus brings, you can cry out to God no matter what your situation is and say, Lord, help me. Hosanna, Lord, save me, Lord, rescue me. And he will hear 
and he will answer. The first reason you can cry out to him is because of the justification he brings. Secondly, the Bible says you can cry out to Jesus and have hope because of the humiliation that Jesus endured. Notice what the Bible says in verse 22 of the text. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. I want to focus on the first half of that verse. The stone that the builders rejected. Here the Bible is looking forward to to the Messiah coming. And though the the psalmist understands that, that the Lord God is going to send his Messiah, he also recognizes the Messiah will be rejected. And not only rejected, not just rejected by anybody, he'll be rejected by the builders, the people in charge. When Jesus came, the Jewish people to whom he came and the Jewish leaders who should have known that he was coming, the religious leaders who had studied his word, rejected Jesus. The Bible talks about how the Lord was rejected in Isaiah 53 verse 3. The Bible says he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He wasn't just, listen, they didn't just say no to Jesus, they rejected him. The word reject means to trash something. It means to despise someone completely. He was like a misshapen stone that didn't fit. And so they trashed him. They threw him away, he was despised. And rejected. The Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus is speaking and he says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus said, I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed before I rise from the dead. They are going to reject me and kill me. Me. John's gospel says it just this simply in John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Later on in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 11, Peter was preaching to the Jewish leaders, and he goes back to Psalm 118 and he quotes it and says this in verse 11 of chapter 4 of Acts This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. We see the humiliation of Jesus. He was absolutely rejected because they didn't know what they were looking at. I read about something that happened some years ago in Tucson, Arizona at a gem and mineral show. There was a gem collector from Texas. He was going through the different stands, all the different displays, things on sale at this mineral, mineral show. And he came across this box of stones. And inside that box of stones was one stone that was sort of bluish purple in color. And it was about the size and shape of a baked potato. And he asked the guy who was selling these stones that were in the box, he said, is this stone worth $15? You're selling this for $15? And that was what the the box was marked. Every stone was $15. So he says, is this stone $15? And the guy took a look at it and he said, no, I tell you what, it's not as good looking as the rest of the stones. I'll sell it to you for 10. And so the guy bought it for $10 because he knew what it was. Later on, he had it appraised. It was a topaz or a sapphire stone that was about uh, $2 million in value. It was rejected by the one who had it but it was, reject, was, was, was recognized by the one who valued it. Now, here's the question. Do you reject Jesus or do you receive him? Who is he to you today? He came to his own people, and the Bible says his own people, the builders, rejected him. Today, you're either in one camp or the other. You either recognize him and receive him or you reject him. There's no middle ground. There are some of you who are here today and you've rejected Jesus as your Savior. You haven't trusted him to give you eternal life. The Bible says if you reject him, one day he'll reject you and you'll spend eternity separated from him in a place called hell. But then I want to speak to believers who are here, and I'm talking about in your day-to-day life, you're rejecting Jesus. You're rejecting him as your helper. You're rejecting him as your master or your Lord, and today he wants you to call out to him and say, Hosanna, Lord, help me. Lord, deliver me. 
Lord, save me. We can cry out to him and find hope because of the humiliation that Jesus endured. I want to remind you of something. If Jesus had not been rejected and humiliated on the cross of Calvary, if he had not died there for us, we could not be saved. Praise God that he was willing to come knowing he would be rejected because he loves you so much because of the humiliation that he endured. Thirdly, the Bible says this, we can come to Jesus and cry out to him and find hope because of the exaltation that Jesus received. The exaltation that Jesus received. Continue reading with me in verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then the Bible says in verse 23, this, all of it, his rejection and the fact that he is now the cornerstone, this is the Lord's doing. God did this. It is marvelous in our eyes. The same one who is rejected, the Bible says that stone that was, was deemed unusable and unworthy and unlovely and trashed, that that stone has become the cornerstone. Now, in my Bible, I've underlined the word cornerstone two times because that word cornerstone in the Hebrew language can have two meanings. Sometimes the cornerstone referred to the, the foundation stone, the stone at the corner of a building, the first stone that was laid in the foundation, and all of the rest of the building was oriented to that one stone. Sometimes that's what the cornerstone means. Sometimes the same word cornerstone is used to describe the capstone or the keystone at the very top of a structure. The last piece to be put in place and that piece that completes the structure and holds everything around it together. Sometimes it's the first stone, the lowest stone in the building. Sometimes it's the last stone, the highest stone in the building. Here's the question. The Bible says, no doubt about it, that Jesus is the cornerstone. Which one is he? Is he the foundation stone or is he the capstone? The answer is yes. He's both. He's both. He is the cornerstone upon which we must build our lives. But then he's the capstone. He's the one who is high and lifted up in our lives. He's the one that our lives must point to. Jesus himself spoke of this in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 13, listen to what Jesus said. He said, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the, the, the alpha. He's the omega. He's the first, he's the last. He's the beginning, he's the end. He's the foundation stone, he's the capstone. I want to ask you today, Christian, what is he in your life? Is he high and lifted up and exalted in your life? Is he the capstone of your life? Is he foundational to everything that you do? Is he the cornerstone in your life, so many of us who call ourselves Christians spend our lives building our lives on or aiming our lives toward something other than Jesus. And that's not what he deserves and that's not what he demands and that's not what he desires. He wants to be all of your life. The cornerstone, the first and the last, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and end of your life and because he is exalted because of the, who he is you can cry out to him for help and you will find in him the help you need there's a fourth reason that you can cry out to Jesus and say hosanna and find hope in him number 4 the bible shows us you can cry out to him because of the salvation Jesus gives the salvation Jesus gives look in verses 24 25 and 26 of the text this is the day that the lord is made let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray. Hashiana, Hosanna. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The psalmist thinks about what the Lord has done, and he says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Of all of the verses in this psalm, this is probably the best known. This is the day the Lord has made. 
let us rejoice and be glad in it. And the truth is, we can say that of every day since the first day of creation. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. When you were born, the day you were born, somebody probably said, who loves you, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On the day you met the love of your life, you may have said somewhere in your heart, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Or you may not have been thinking about that at all on the day you met the love of your life. But you may have said it. The day you held your newborn son or daughter in your arms, looked down into that precious face, you may have said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On the day that you were saved, the day you trusted Jesus as your Savior. The Bible says all of heaven rejoiced. The angels of heaven said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You can say that of the greatest days in your life, but can I tell you something else? On the day you found out that your mother passed away, you can say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On the day they call you in and tell you you don't have a job there anymore, you can say this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On the day you find out that the diagnosis is as bad as it can be, you can say this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whether it's the best day of your life or the worst day of your life, this is true of every day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But stop right there. When the Bible says this is the day in verse 24, the Word of God is speaking of one particular day. And that's the day when Jesus came into Jerusalem to bring salvation to his people. That Palm Sunday as they shouted out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This psalm was written a thousand years before Jesus Christ was born. And yet the psalmist looked forward to that day and said, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And all of heaven rejoiced on that day on Palm Sunday, and then that holy week, every day was the day the Lord made for his people to rejoice and be glad in it. On Holy Monday and Tuesday, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On Spy Wednesday, as Judas was looking for an opportunity to, to betray his Lord and Master Jesus, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On Monday, Thursday, as Jesus washed his disciples' feet and commanded them, love one another. A new commandment I have given you, that you love one another. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On Good Friday, as Jesus hung on the cross for six hours and suffered and bled and died for you on that day, this is the day. The Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On that Saturday that was dark and silent and it seemed like hope was gone. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And on that Easter Sunday when up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it in it. Praise the Lord for the salvation that Jesus Christ brings. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You can call out to him and say, Lord, save us and in him find hope because of the salvation that Jesus brings. I was talking to my son, Joshua, and our son, uh, some of you know, is a pharmacist. He's, he's in his second year as a full-time pharmacist. And, 
And he's really the first person in our family to be in any type of medical field. And so I was just talking to him and um, I said, Joshua, how did you learn how to diagnose people? And I said, that's something you have to do. You have to figure out whether this person is supposed to have this medication. It's something, one of the things that you're, he said, well, he said, you know, he said, anybody, whether you're a nurse or whether you're a doctor or whatever type of medical work you're in, he said, you do have to sort of learn a process for diagnosis. And he said, the most helpful thing that, that I learned when, when, when I was in school was the acronym SOAP. And he said, in fact, he says some, something they sort of teach doctors and nurses and pharmacists and other people, S-O-A-P. I said, so what does that stand for? He said, well, the, the S stands for subjective data. So the patient comes in and says, you know, I've got a headache or I've got shortness of breath, whatever they're feeling, that's the first part. That's the subjective data. He said, the O is objective data. He said, that's when you run blood work or you you do tests and you begin to find out objectively what the problem seems to be. He said, then the A stands for assessment. He said, that's when you look at the subjective data and the objective data and you, you assess what, what, the, what the issue is, what the condition is. He said, then the P stands for plan. And that's when you decide what the treatment needs to be. He said, that, that just sort of helps me. He said, you don't always, you know, see all of those steps outlined. He said, but when a doctor is writing a prescription or anything, he said, you can sort of, sort of see the SOAP and what they're doing. I said, okay, that, that's good. I said, all right, Joshua, um, what if you were to take somebody to Dr. Jesus? And Joshua said, don't say Dr. Jesus. I said, well, I'm a preacher. That's how I talk. I said, and the, uh, so, but let's say, let's say you take somebody to the great physician, Jesus. And he said, okay, that's better because that's, that's biblical. All right, so you, you take somebody to Jesus. I said, can you see the SOAP in that? And I just began to think about that. Yes, the subjective data, what we experience because of our condition called sin. And, and there are things that we feel and experience subjectively because of our sin. We feel the guilt of our own sin. We feel the regret for the hurt that we've caused others. Or we may feel a separation and distance from God because of our sin, or we may feel a lack of purpose or meaning in our lives because sin in our life robs our life of meaning. All of those things are subjective things that we feel because of our sin. And then there's the objective data. The objective data is what God can see and what other people can see in our lives because of our sin. Other, listen, other people can see the effects of sin in your life. Sin leads to broken relationships with people that you care about. Sin causes you to say things and do things that break the heart of God and that disobey God's objective laws and, and what his word says. And so then there's that objective problem of, of sin. Sin can trap us in an ongoing cycle where we just keep on getting deeper and deeper and deeper into our own sin. So there's the subjective effects of our sin and the objective effects of our sin and then the assessment. God's word assesses our condition. And here's what he says. He says, your sin separates you from God. It says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse two, your sin causes God to hide his face from you. In the book of James, the Bible says, desire gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. The book of Romans says the wages of sin is death. That, that's the assessment. The problem is sin. Every person here has been infected by a disease called sin. And that sin keeps us out of God's presence forever. That sin causes spiritual death. That sin leads to judgment and hell. But praise God, God has a plan. S-O-A-P, plan. God has a plan. And God's plan for taking care of your sin and my sin was to send his son Jesus. 
There are two verses of Scripture that I'm going to close with today. One of them is very, very familiar to you. The other one, which is right next to it, may not be as familiar. It's John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I want you to say with me the words of John 3, 16. We'll say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's John 3, 16. Here's John 3, 17. The Bible says God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be, you know what the last word is? Saved. That was God's plan. He knew our sin. He knew what sin caused in us, what sin causes in, in others because of our sin. He knew the problem is our sin. He knows that that sin leads us to hell, but he loves us so much that he planned to send his son, knowing that his son would be rejected, crucified on the cross. He planned to send his son to pay the price for your sin so that you can be saved. And so you can call out to him and say, Lord, save me. Because everything that needs to be done for you to be saved, Jesus has already done. You say, Lord, save me. And he will answer yes.